All right, uh, we get started once more time. This is a grand rounds, uh, five o'clock. Uh, uh, welcome back. This is the future of cardiology uh, series and we are examining how we are all moving towards uh, uh, the new culture creation using innovation techniques in, in cardiology. And today we have a very exciting forum, uh, which will look into the future of interventional and structural uh, cardiology and where it is going. But before I introduce uh, uh, the speaker, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share uh, the slides that will uh, enable you to uh, collect the CME credits. As you would know that Cardiology Grand Rounds is now hosted on the website in the Department of uh, Medicine uh, within the division. Once you go into the Grand Round section, you will see the previous uh, Grand Rounds uh, that are recorded on YouTube channels and provided there. Uh, so anyone can go and uh, be uh, able to uh, visit those Grand Round sessions. Uh, now for this particular Grand Round session, uh, if you are interested in getting a CME credit for the session, at this moment, please go ahead and text 12446 to the number 8888164893. And uh, do this within the next 12 hours so that you're recorded and you're able to get your transcripts uh, for the CME credits. And this should be in form of a text message uh, as an SMS message and not an iMessage. And many of you have inquired of how do we get into the system? So you need to have an active profile in the Rutgers Cloud CME with a mobile number and the mobile uh, phone field in your profile. Also for this grand round series, you would be knowing that we have uh, introduced MOC points for physicians and for that, you need to first of all have a profile in the CME cloud, and then you have to complete the step one. So you will go and record the CME credit. And after that, you have to go onto this link and this link and, and the details will be continuously provided to you in text messages. And you can use that to record that information. And once you get through this CME session and you log on, to this website, you have a room code Future 4. This is the fourth grand round in the series. So it's Future 04, and you will be able to get in. You have to answer the quiz. And if you have majority of the quiz answered correctly, you will be getting your credit as MOC points. And this MOC points will directly go and get into your ACGME website. And if you want to do that, it's important that your date of birth and ABIM ID is entered into the website because without that, your identity would not be known and your MOC point cannot be registered with your ABIM website. So with those points, which are um, uh, important for us to get through the CME, and the MOC credits and will be announced again in the chat section. It's my great pleasure and privilege to bring to you Dr. Muhammad Adnan Al-Kuli, who is the professor of medicine uh, and uh, research and innovation chair for interventional cardiology division at Mayo Clinic School of Medicine in Rochester. Uh, Mohammed has had a fantastic uh, career so far, and I'm really thrilled that we've been uh, colleagues uh, when I was at West Virginia University. He came from uh, Damascus University uh, in Syria, uh, where he did his residency, then came to Temple University Hospital to do his internal medicine, and then also did his fellowship in cardiovascular disease there. Uh, he also had a fellowship in vascular medicine, and then did a coronary and endovascular interventional fellowship at, uh, in Rochester, uh, following which he also did a structural heart and disease intervention uh, fellowship at Mayo Clinic Rochester. Following his um, uh, uh, fellowship, he was uh, brought into West Virginia School of Medicine 
uh, at the Harden Rascal Institute when I had an opportunity to meet him when he was a young faculty. And boy, his, uh, his, his uh, career has been nothing more than just being spectacular. Within a, a short span of four years, I think he illustrated uh, uh, some of his very gifted abilities to bring in people together. Uh, the fellows were always uh, uh, wanting to work around him. He created an environment uh, where there was scholarship and he provided a lot of guidance and support uh, for people to be innovative. And for those reasons and his ability to uh, carry out activity and, and carry out a very in a very entrepreneurial way, I would say, um, he became extremely popular. So he became the director of the structural program and ascended very quickly uh, into the limelight, into the program there. Uh, in the lab, uh, he, was, uh, he has been extremely proficient with any of the structural interventions. And I remember uh, one specific case where we had on table rupture of the aortic root. And um, I think uh, with his uh, uh, candor and ability to go through the crisis, he went ahead and plugged that rupture. And it was a European Heart Journal uh, uh, report uh, that was accepted. And I, I still remember those times, Mohammed. It was, it was just wonderful to be able to uh, work with you and your ability to be in a multidisciplinary team and yet take the work to a next level was really appreciated. But what is, um, what is phenomenal is his, uh, his hunger and his dedication to not just uh, serve his patient, but also to the scholarship and educational activities. I think he must be one of the fastest um, producer of uh, 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 work and publication. So I think within a four years time span, he had almost over 200 manuscripts. He was publishing at the rate of almost a manuscript a week. Uh, and now he is uh, close to about 270 publications. Uh, so within a span of his fellowship and now, which is, which is not, which is about four or five years. I mean, he has very quickly ascended and become the professor of cardiology at uh, at, at uh, Mayo Clinic, which is uh, uh, extremely uh, creditable and rare to see at this age group, young age group. So he's one of clear leaders in cardiology. He's extremely popular on the Twitter. Uh, he's associate, uh, associate editor of Jack Cardiovascular Intervention. He has numerous awards and he's been very well supported from Mayo Clinic with career development awards um, he's been one of the top reviewers in Jack and Jack Interventions. Uh, I frequently uh, solicit his help for Jack Imaging as well. He's currently the chair of the research committee, and uh, and and probably uh, his. I think I've learned that he's doing also some career in innovation, and he's converging to AI and other innovative tools. So with that words, Mohammed, it's uh, such a pleasure to have you back, and we are excited to. Um, see you give us this grand rounds. Thank you, Partha. This is a very humbling introduction. Thank you very much. And uh, I do have to disclose that, you know, one time I was coming out of a case and you told me, uh, you know, you, you should really share this knowledge on Twitter. And I said, no, 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 that's really not that important. So I think you got me on that. So thank you for, for doing that. But anyhow, so I, it's a privilege to, to join you today for this uh, conference. And, uh, you know, as Partho said, the, we're gonna talk about the future of interventional cardiology. What we are not going to do is we're not gonna talk about this device or that device. Um, really, this is going to be mostly going through the journey that we have all enjoyed. Maybe starting with a little bit of a historical perspective. Um, there are no disclosures relevant to this talk. Uh, uh, talking a little bit about how the journey of interventional cardiology started, where we're at now, what are the current unmet needs, and just speculate a little bit about the futuristic outlook of our profession in the next 20, 30 years. It's not to claim that we have the answers or we know where the field is going, but at least provide some speculation. Uh, and one important thing that I would like probably to emphasize indirectly in this is if we are as physicians not evolving, uh, we're just gonna continue to follow the wave. So when I met with Partho first time, you know, a few years ago, 
I really didn't know much about AI or wasn't really interested in it as much. But then as, as you know, you, you take, you pick a field, you pick an area and you try to master that, publish, learn, practice. And then you have to be on the look for something new, something futuristic, right? So that, that we have to evolve. So hopefully I'll share with you some of that. Um, and uh, I always try to start with the, with, the, um, with the historical perspective. Indeed, this quote was provided by Partho for one of the editorials we wrote a few years ago, um, talking about 3D printing back then. And I think it's very true because it's, if, we don't, if we don't understand how things started, what kind of innovative mindsets and hard work that led to those innovations, um, then we really can't really imagine the future. So we're, we're getting close to about 100 years, uh, now 91, 92 years since the start of our field. And we all know this famous uh, picture where the first catheter, you know, flexible catheter was inserted in a, in a vein, anticubital vein via cut down into the chest. The operator, Forsman, has taken that to the radiology department, took a picture, got fired for it eventually. And, you know, that, has, that was the first catheterization in human of some sort of uh, cardiovascular catheterization. So now, you know, fast forward, nothing really happened for a few years after that. That, uh, that attempt sort of uh, terminated uh, Forsman career in cardiology. He switched to urology after many years of not able to find the job. Um, so Cornand and Richards then took, built on those, you know, initial observations and only, you know, it took 13, 14 years from that uh, initial description for somebody to publish a paper on invasive hemodynamics. And all what they're showing here is simply right atrial pressure and systemic pressure in patients with normal function and in patients with heart failure. But you know, that, that was the start really of, of invasive slash interventional cardiology. Then many, many publications came about. We started diagnosing valve disease and myocardial disease using invasive hemodynamic. And that was like the, at that time, probably people were thinking, this is the golden age, this we're doing great. They had no idea what will happen 50 years later, right? But that was the golden age back then. And uh, that led to a, a very famous Nobel Prize uh, in medicine for these two individuals who did the work on physiology. But also Forsman shared the prize with them because he actually is the person who did the first uh, catheterization. So, so now, now we're getting closer to our time, right? So this is 60, 65 years ago. And the whole field was invasive hemodynamics, diagnosis of valve disease. You could tell the patient you have severe AS or you have uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or something. But at the same time, there was another revolution happening in silence or in parallel, let's say. So I don't know if anybody can recognize this picture. This is the um, first picture of an ultrasound image, actually, of a living human being presented in 1951. Or what you could tell that this is a head and this is the anterior, this is the posterior, and these are the ventricles, right? You can't really tell much more than that. But yet this was another, another revolution and just contrast this image to what kind of imaging Partho provides you in your procedure now. So now we all know that that revolution continues, uh, continued pretty rapidly and mode came about just a couple of years after that and then you know elder presented the famous uh, m mode of aortic and mitral valve disease in the 1960 and that has a that was the start of a very very uh, impressive journey of innovation in echocardiography so now you have to think about all of the advancements that we had in interventions as parallel to those advancements that will happen in imaging because you know you cannot really operate unless you're able to see um, and those, those things uh, went hand by hand throughout uh, the next 50, 60 years. Now, at the same time, you know, a major mistake that you all know by Dr. Sons, um, he, was, he had a catheter in the ascending aorta. He was supposed to inject a 30, 40 cc's of contrast to look at the aortic, uh, aortic uh, ascending aorta. And that catheter accidentally jumped into the coronary artery at the time of the injection. 
and he shouted, as you all know, he shouted, we killed the patient. And he went to do chest compression on him because the wisdom back then that if you inject large amount of contrast in the coronary artery, you're gonna get arrhythmogenic and die. Uh, so he was surprised to see that the patient only had a couple PVCs and nothing happened despite the large amount. So that would be equivalent to doing an LV gram in a coronary artery now, right? So, so he said, he said, well, if we're able to do it and patient didn't die, maybe I could perfect this and just use less amount and, um, and you know, uh, do diagnostic and geography. And that really shifted interventional cardio. It wasn't really interventional. It's still not interventional now. That shifted invasive cardiology from just purely providing measurement of pressures to now being able to visualize arteries and things. Now that was that was not the first angiogram of any vascular structure because angiography has existed before for peripheral vessels, uh, but that was the first one to be done in the coronary. Now, again, we do have to give credit to our vascular colleagues because they have been actually faster than us in, in inventing uh, a lot of the tools that we use now. We think we're the first ones who invented, you know, dilatation and stenting. It's actually an interventional radiologist slash vascular specialist, Dr. Dodder, who was just using sequential dilatation of uh, catheters. So you would use a catheter, upsize it to a larger catheter. And then he felt his patients were getting better. Then he documented that in his famous circulation paper. And that was the beginning, true beginning of interventional cardiovascular, uh, transcatheter cardiovascular interventions. So now keep an eye on this, this picture because daughter, despite him being a vascular person, um, there was another, another cardiologist, German cardiologist who was aspiring to find something new or do something new. We all know who he is. Uh, and this is a picture uh, combining him and daughter. So he was closely following his work. And when he felt that, you know, uh, he hasn't he, he able to accomplish uh, more innovation in his country, he has moved multiple times. But keep an eye on this picture because you will find out what he did later on. Uh, before we actually even got to dilating coronary arteries or doing anything, uh, cabbage happened or coronary artery bypass grafting was invented. This, the first one was in 1967. Uh, just about the same time, we were actually just about perfecting uh, coronary catheter. These coronary catheters that you see in the picture are the same ones that we use today with very high success over 50 years after they were invented. So um, Andres Grunzik, as we uh, showed you in the prior picture, was inspired by daughter, and he really wanted to fix the issue of coronary stenosis. If they're able to do it in the periphery, we should be able to do it in the coronary. That was his, that, this were his words. The next, the picture on the left side is actually his wife. And this is his kitchen table where he would frequently, uh, along his wife, try to innovate and make devices and try to come up with something. So the first balloon angioplasty was made on this kitchen table uh, with the help of his wife and was presented later. Again, anytime somebody comes in with a disruptive innovation, he was ridiculized and he was mocked and they, the word crazy probably came about, about a thousand times a day. But yet he did prove that, you know, he has, that you can potentially dilate uh, atherosclerotic coronary lesions. So that took off and a lot of, you know, balloons were invented and, and um, coronary interventions remained limited to just dilatation, which were nightmares for practicing cardiologists back then because of occlude, acute occlusions, the large sheath, all of that. It was great, but it wasn't great now. Um, so around the same time, people started looking into the valve situation. Can we, can we do something with catheters to fix valves? And just about the same times, actually, two years apart, the first uh, balloon angioplasty in the aortic position was published by, by Alain Croupier, was accomplished and published. And the first balloon and uh, valvuloplasty on the mitral side was published by Inouye, which we all know we still have the same balloon now after many, many years. Right? So that, that evolution that what we call today structural heart really started about then 
but it wasn't in the advanced form that we we see now. But if you want to date back, you know, where when when structural heart started, maybe you could say in the early 1980 uh, with balloon valvuloplasty. Now the the first uh, coronary stent was placed in 1987. So the the 80s were actually another peak of golden time of innovation in in interventional cardiology. This picture is for the first coronary stent that was hand uh, self-expandable. You know, we never use those in the coronaries anymore. That was a self-expandable uh, balloon um, stent mounted in a balloon, and that was placed in the proximal LAD. If you could see on the top picture, that was the initial initial diagnostic picture showing critical LAD lesion. After they ballooned the artery, the artery closed, likely due to a dissection. Right, so the stent was then placed, and that stent was checked ten years later, and it was still patent in an anniversary event. Um, so that was really the the outstanding field, uh, the beginning of this field of coronary stenting. But if you think what happened between, you know, if you look at the coronary arteries between then and now, what we have is we have better stents we have better imaging to you know, look at the stents and better physiology to evaluate the coronary lesions. But nothing has been as disruptive as the, these first two innovations, balloon dilatation and then, uh, and then stenting, right? So that's why uh, beginning in the late 90s, early 2000, the, 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 the hunger has shifted more into some other things, like we really to innovate in something else. So that that brought about, you know, all of the vascular interventions became, became much more advanced. The structural heart field started, which we'll talk about now. Um, now, for, for if you have residents or fellows in the, in the audience, I really would like, this is a very inspiring story that I think we should all study, not just come about, uh, come across quickly. So this person, Dr. Anderson uh, from Denmark, was an intern in 1989. When he came to Arizona, watched the conference, he saw a cardiologist uh, putting a stent. That was just, you know, the first days of the stents, coronary stents. And he said to himself, well, why don't we just make it 10 times bigger and stent your textinosis, right? So we all come up with what we what, what is quoted as a crazy idea, but he didn't just have the idea. He went back home he got a little grant. He was able to actually self-made, uh, he self-made all of those uh, sutured stents on a metal frame. He proved it in the first pig, and then he did 40 cases, not one or two. He did 40 pigs where he implanted a valve. Despite that, it took him three years to get a case report accepted. Can you imagine? I mean, there were probably five journals back then accepting things, right? So there are not a lot of uh, places where he could go, but he got rejected right and left until the European Heart Journal took the case report. That case report has over 2,000 citations now, and that has changed the world of interventional cardiology. Sadly for him, he, you know, it took him several years. He did patent, two patents in the U.S. were issued under his name. So can you just imagine how much time and effort and resilience he had to have to get that. But you know, after that, the reality hits. Uh, no industry connection, not an established career. Nobody listened to him. He had to give up his patent at a very, very trivial, you know, number. To Dr. Cripier, who was much more senior, had you know all the connections and able to pull things together. Despite that, Cripier himself will show you slides of actual quotes of surgeons, industry leaders, and how they ridiculized him himself, despite being an established leader in the field. Fast forward to 2002, the first TAVR was performed in France. This is the picture of the patient. He survived the TAVR, lived for a few months, and then died from sequelae of infection. The first TAVR actually was transeptal. Um, and it was done with conscious sedation, moderate sedation, which is what we do now after many years, right? So, so this marks, you know, as of now, we know that in the US, there is close to 300,000 TAVRs done, over half a million worldwide. And you, you could, I'll just leave it to your imagination to think about how many valves are being developed or going to be in the market in another 20 years. 
So this is 2002, just one year after the first mitra clip was placed in Venezuela. Uh, you know, these two trains had different speed, uh, likely related to the differences in the complexity of the valve structure, right? With the aortic valve, we all know that it's a much easier valve to handle than the mitral valve. But the, the innovation started about, you know, close to each other, not far behind. First in man here was in 2003, first in man for Taver was in 2002. And then, and then we know where we're at now with MitraClip. There's also about over five, over 100,000 cases done worldwide, over 50,000 in the US. We're up to fourth generation of MitraClip. And I hear from the reps that they're working on generation six now. So we all know how, how this has changed the life of many, many patients. Same year, 2002, um, uh, the first left atrial appendage closure was done by Horst Sievert in Germany. That was with the old uh, Plato device that's no longer available. But that also was the first proof of concept that you could actually close the appendage safely. And again, now this is the fastest growing uh, procedure among all structural procedures in the US. So what happened in the last decade, the, the, the focus, you know, this, the focus on aortic valve and the watchman and the mitral valve was more to incrementally improve the therapy, but the, the disruptive innovation shifted more to replacement of the mitral valve and repair and replacement of the tricuspid valve. So I, I just gave you uh, here a, a, a view of the valves actually that have some data, some clinical and human data, but there is about five times more of other devices, uh, repair and replacement that are in the works. Now, I don't know how many can we afford at the end, but there'll probably be just a handful of each uh, mechanism of repair or replacement, but this is the, this is the landscape as of now. So now, now we've talked about the journey and what we have achieved. And, you know, all of those people who uh, were now, you can't do this with COVID now, but all of those people who were dying to learn surgery all decided, oh, well, how, how did we waste all these years? We should really be in the cat lab now. So you've seen much more interest in interventional cardiology, structural interventions. You tell people there are not a lot of structural jobs. It doesn't matter. We love it so much that we're going to do it regardless, right? That's what you hear today from, from fellows. So this is how much the field has grown. And, and just remember, this is not in the, the age of human being is how many years, thousands and thousands of years humans have been around. This is all 50 years, 60 years, right? 60 years ago, we had nothing. The first time we had somebody just measuring the pressure, we were celebrating it. And just think about the width and breadth of what we have now. All right. So now we talked about history. We talked about where we're at now, right? So Every one of us has speculations. I don't know. I, I don't really do stock markets, but who, those people are pretty smart about predicting the future uh, who master that kind of science. But also some of the most achieved athletes, they, they say the same thing. They say our success come not from looking at what's happening now, but from looking at what is going to happen. You all know this. Uh, whoever is, is interested in hockey you know, would, would know this. Uh, would know this quote here, I skate to where the puck is going, not where it has been or where it is now, right? Uh, so, so we're in the next uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes, I'm just going to go over a few predictions that I have for how the field is going to evolve. And again, this is, everybody has their own predictions. I don't think we could all match uh, our predictions, but Again, the goal here is not to say, oh, Sapien is going to be better than Core Valve or Watchman is going to be better than Amulet. It's, this is not about a device or what's the next tent or what's the next whatever medication. This is just about concept that I think will take over uh, in innovation in the next 20 years. So I want you to spend just a minute here looking at this video uh, before I advance the slide. So just take a minute and just look at the video.
So I'm going to play it without sound while we're while we're discussing this. But the first point here is is related to the pathophysiology of um, cardiovascular disease. So far, our tools have really focused on anatomy and in a pretty crude way. And I think uh, a lot of people, including Parthu, have been pioneers in this area to convince us that we may be using, we may have been using the wrong tools or maybe inadequate tools, if not the wrong tools. But somebody who can look at this video uh, can easily tell you that it makes no sense to take this beautiful setup of the mitral structure and take a tri-leaflet valve and put it sideways where you're shifting all of this beautiful kind of uh, flow and you're pretending that we're successful in healing or curing the patient, right? So this is how this is how mitral valve replacement works, right? You you disrupt everything that is native. Uh, we declare victory, and uh, you could see here how the flow is 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 gets all messed up. And if you look uh, in some of the Japanese studies, there is like fifty percent up to fifty percent loss of energy by doing a replacement of the mitral valve. But if you ask all interventional fellows, if you go to any conference now and talk about card talk to cardiologists, everybody is just hungry to put his hand or her hand on a TMVR device, right? I think that's fine, but are we really seeing the full picture or not? That's not only in the aortic valve, uh, that not only in the mitral valve, but that's true in the aortic in, in pretty much anywhere we are doing procedures. So what I'm showing you here is a valve in valve, uh, and we, you know, we we don't really think much about the reason why the structures are structured the way they are. The coronary sinuses are designed for a reason. They they, they function for they, they serve a certain function that we may not understand, but we really don't take into that into account. As long as we don't obstruct flow, we just say put any valve that you want. This study here shows you, this is the coronary sinus here on the left side. There is a surgical valve at the bottom, same surgical valve in all three pictures. And then what you see is the sapiens three inside the surgical valve. You see an evolute R inside the surgical valve and you see an, you see an accurate neo. Just look of how different the sinus flow is between the three valves. Amazing differences, right? So do we really, take that into account, not much as of today. Here's another example. Now this is, this is more hemodynamic than flow dynamic, right? So this is a case where a patient had a degenerative mitral regurgitation, as you can see on the TE on the left side, very severe MR. And we were asked to put, uh, this is actually mixed etiology, but we were asked to put a mitral clip on the patient. Take a look at how what was the lift atrial pressure at the beginning? The V wave was 60, the, the mean LA pressure was 30, right? So we go ahead and we place the first clip in the A2P2 region. And you look at the color Doppler afterwards and you see there are a couple of jets, it's more on the left than the right. And um, it was graded as moderate by the, a very skilled imaging, interventional imager, right? Look at the LA pressure at the bottom, it's normal. Right. So, what do you do in this case? Do you follow the color? Do you follow the, the 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 pulmonary veins normalized, but the the color is pretty convincing that this is more than mild MR, right? So, do you want to leave it as such, or do you want to go further? We debated, and we really don't know what to do. So, we went ahead and put another clip. And those who do clips, they know that once you start chasing that, you may get better, you may get worse, you may may be the same. So we put a second clip and uh, it was, I think that the, the operator was just nicely telling us that maybe it's mild to moderate, but the color, the sum of the color was the same. Look at the, look at the uh, pressure was still normal. So did we do a patient a service by putting a second clip or not? We don't know. What matters more? Is it the flow dynamics and the hemodynamics or is it the manifestation that we see on, on, on echocardiography? We looked at our own data here. We have over 500 patients who had uh, mitral clip with invasive hemodynamics. And after adjusting for um, echo success, 
left atrial pressure was independently associated with long-term survival. That tells us that the pressure matters, right? Uh, but we don't really take in that into account in our current procedure. Here's an example of another, another uh, procedure that we do commonly, or we talk about commonly, uh, valve in MAC. It's a very you know, sexy procedure. People like to show it in conference and talk about it. A lot of people are questioning the hemodynamic benefit because this, this, these patients are fairly sick. They have a very high degree of diastolic dysfunction and they have chronically elevated LA pressure. Take a look at the top. You see a patient who had rheumatic mitral stenosis and you look at what happens to the LA pressure after successful ballooning. LA pressure comes down by half. At the bottom, you have, a, you have patients with valve and MAC. It's a successful implantation, but nothing changes. The LA pressure doesn't change. So are we really understanding the disease or not? So num prediction number one, actually I'll show you one more slide or two more slides and then we'll talk about, we'll give you a statement of prediction. This is a case that we had in West Virginia, and I think Parcel, Parcel was doing the imaging on this case. It's a TAVR patient. We finished the procedure. Two hours later, the patient had some weird symptoms. We were suspecting a stroke, did a CT, it was normal. We did use a Sentinel device here. And then four hours later, the patient had different kind of symptoms, but they were more convincing now. We repeated the CT and there was a piece of calcium that lodged into the middle cerebral artery that wasn't there two hours before. So this didn't happen in the procedure, it happened later, right? So when we, when we have these trials failing to show a benefit of embolic protection, do we really understand, understand how stroke happens after, after TAVR or not? Take a look at uh, you know, the transcatheter interventions we have now for tricuspid disease. We're going completely the opposite way of logic. We have companies who are interested in making devices. We have cardiologists who are interested in doing procedures and we're innovating. We do, do we understand the disease? No. Do we understand the natural progression of TR? What causes TR? How different it is from MR? Who should be treated, who not? No idea. But we have devices. We have to fit them somewhere, right? We have pe people wanting to do procedures. We have to find the pool of patients, regardless of if we understand this disease well or not. So I think uh, my, my first prediction is there are connections between diseases and cardiac structure that are poorly understood. And I think that's probably because maybe I should make this instead of the wrong tools, maybe incomplete tools, maybe because we are using the incom incomplete tools. I think uh, flow dynamics and pathophysiology will, will come back to become a main a key player in bridging this gap and providing us with better understanding. Let's go to the second prediction. We're all you know, happy that we see this uh, lampoon, uh, basilica procedures. There are more talks about basilica and lampoon than the actual patients who have been treated with these techniques because there are very innovative, disruptive techniques. This is the first time where we could actually do microsurgery outside of mitra clip. You're actually modifying uh, tissue and you're doing things that the surgeons used to do in an open fashion, right? So there are reasons why people got wildly excited about those procedures, despite the fact that they, they're, not, they're not negligible complications associated with them. Uh, and you could even look at some other things in, in transcatheter mitral valve and tricuspid valve innovation uh, interventions. And you could see that we're almost mimicking surgery. I mean, look at on the left side, you have a the millipede device, which is an annuloplasty device from uh, Boston Scientific. And in the middle, you have the, uh, la the Harbor device, which allows you to, do, uh, to implant the cord to the apex. And then you have the, uh, the matra clip and the competitor uh, clasp device on the right side. So, so all of those are kind of microsurgery. So what is, what is hindering us from doing more? Why can't we repair the valve? Why can't we just do mitral valve repair in the cath lab instead of doing robotic surgery? This is a problem. We can't see. You know, don't we all, all wish that we could see the same as the GI physicians see when they put their endoscope? That would be great if we could do that. We haven't been able to. Endoscopy has had a lot of issues. 
And this is the this is the picture that's the equivalent of endoscopy that we can get in the vasculature because we don't have tools that are able to image through blood so far. We don't really have a lot of data, but I speculate that is going to be an emerging field because we have the large catheter ability now. We have the tools, we have the skills to do those kind of intervention. We just can't see well. So if we solve the issue of imaging through blood, I think microsurgery will become a big deal uh, in structural interventions. We started to do that with OCT now. We could, we could do it uh, without, without contrast, with reasonable results. But fast forward 20 years from now, I think you will start seeing people doing uh, cut and sew uh, mitral valve repair in the cath lab. So the prediction statement is transcatheter microsurgery has evolved uh, considerably, it's still not as advanced, but the future progress, the future progress of it really depends on imaging. I think once we solve that, then we'll see a big revolution in microsurgery. We'll move to the third one now. Partha, I think we're okay on time, right? We could keep going. I think maybe a few more minutes. Yeah, yeah, we are good. Thank okay. you. So the, the third one is about clinical trials. Um, we all, you know, celebrated or not celebrated, whatever your position is, the ischemia trial. But one notable thing was the cost. Um, I don't think people will be able, the society or societies will be able to continue to sustain multi-million dollar trials to answer one question that at the end of the trial came up with more questions than the, the first question that was posed, right? So think about one trial that costed $100 million. And those of us who, belong, who came from overseas, they, they can't, it's a jaw-dropping number. Like how, that, that is a budget for a small country for a year in, outside of the US. And this is just to answer one question. Uh, so I think we, we also started to see the rise of more, um, I would say, nimble way of doing uh, generating evidence. We don't want to compromise on the evidence. We don't want to say, you know, trials are not important. They are, but we have to find new ways of doing things. You know, the test trial was pretty ahead of its time, and that is possible in Europe because they have, they have the liberty to do that. I think this will be challenging in the US, but maybe in the future, uh, to do, you know, randomization on the spot. So the test trial that randomized patients to receive um, uh, routine thrombectomy versus no routine thrombectomy in the setting of a STEMI was randomization on the spot. You, you get enrolled in the registry and then the computer would generate what you use and you go with the procedure. Uh, that has saved tons and tens of millions of dollars and this trial would have not been able to be completed if you are to talk to 5,000 STEMI patients and ask them would they be able to do this and talk to the physicians and all of that. So I think we're going to see more of the more of those uh, pragmatic kind of trials and registry kind of trials coming up in the future. We at Mayo just had one published in Nature Medicine by the Heart Rhythm AI group, where they were able to find an AI algorithm that uses the ECG to tell you if the patient has uh, predict if the patient has uh, atrial fibrillation or not. Same thing for uh, heart failure, same thing for aortic stenosis. In this trial, they focused on heart failure where the, 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 the physicians, the primary care physician were blinded uh, to half of them just went with routine care and half of them took AI, the AI algorithm uh, output that suggested if this patient has heart failure or not to, to go after that and do an echo. And that has shown to, to be able to identify many more patients with heart failure than what the naked eye would have, or the routine care would have uh, identified. A third venue for uh, novel, kind of novel methods of doing trial is leveraging claim-based databases and combining them with, uh, with solid uh, kind of evidence generating mechanisms. So, so here, the, these authors here, what they did is they, they took patients who were enrolled in clinical trials and they, they used their Medicare claims to find out what event they had based on the codes. And then they, they, com they, they compared that to what the trial adjudicated you know, uh, committees have said. And they found very good um, correlation if the, if the intervention, if, if the outcome is like death or a procedure. 
because that has a procedural billing code. They found modest evidence for some intervention, some, some events like myocardial infarction, AKI, and more poor uh, association with bleeding. Yet this was a novel effort to at least start having things talk to each other and using these databases in a smart way to generate high quality evidence. So the prediction statement here is that the RCTs are coming to increasingly become very, very costly, um, mostly non-affordable. Cost-effective strategies for generating high quality evidence will become mainstream in the future. And the word pragmatic trial will increasingly be heard in, in, in conferences. So let's shift to AI now. So hype or hope, right? You hear AI, some people who are very passionate about it, you ha they tell you AI five times in a sentence. And some people who are dismissive of it, they would say just, you know, it's buzzword, it doesn't mean anything. Where does the truth lie? And I think that's, what, that's where we, we, ha we physicians have to learn this so we can lead the field. And, and you all you know, have uh, leaders in, the, in that and, and at your institution. But there are, we have the, the ability of AI to change our field has to be with the way we use it and the way we ask the question. If we view AI as something that will solve the world's problem, that's not a very smart way of approaching AI. If you, if you identify unmet needs and clear questions that humans are struggling to, to answer, but then bring AI to test it there, then you might come up with very, very useful tools. We already know that we have, AI is now being able to, to look at an ECG and tell you if this patient has high likelihood of having aortic stenosis because it could detect subtle abnormalities on the ECG that may convey pressure overload or volume overload or chronic hypertension um, on, the, uh, on the ECG. We're able now to use unsupervised learning to identify patterns of diseases that then actually correlate with uh, long-term outcomes. And the, the, I would think about AI is like, you know, a Tesla or some, maybe not Tesla, maybe those, some of those fancy multi hundred thousand dollar cars. They need precious fuel. If you put, if you put bad fuel in AI algorithm, they're gonna give you bad, uh, bad outputs. But if you think about it smartly and you put very solid data in it and you feed it with a proper fuel, then you will get a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of good outcomes from it. In the cath lab, we, we, have to, we have to embrace that and see how can our life be better in the cath lab. We don't wanna go after the hype, but there are a lot of things that are cumbersome in our procedures that actually can be streamlined by AI. I think about AI as something that you are able to do as a human, but it is very cumbersome. Or it may take 100,000 human beings to, to do one task that the AI algorithm by you know, iterative training can, can help you achieve. It can, you could also use it for simple things. So we, this is a study that we just did here using 25,000 patients who had cardiac surgery and you know, we had an algorithm built to identify heart failure. So we said, what if this algorithm actually is able to identify subtle cardiomyopathy that can, can predict long-term outcomes? And it nicely predicted long-term mortality after cabbage, after valve surgery, after a combination of both. We could also use, even in administrative databases, we could use AI to predict common things that are important to the, for the society like readmissions, right? That should be predictable, that you should be apply, able to apply supervised or unsupervised learning and identify those patients who are gonna come back to the hospital and do more intensive, uh, uh, target them with more intense, intensive therapies. So the prediction statement for AI is, AI has so far in interventional cardiology received mixed review I think there is a big potential for AI to address sound clinical questions that may transform the way we do procedures, but with a proper use. So I'll give you one, one example of that is there, there are some groups now that are working on, instead of, for example, using 3D echo the way we use it now, use combined uh, 
to the echo and CT scan to come up with a new way of doing, doing um, ultrasound, maybe call it a virtual ultrasound. So those kind of innovation are coming, uh, but they are probably buried inside a whole host of hype kind of studies that are, that are around. And that's why people are not appreciating the true value of AI in, in interventional cardiology. Next one is multimodality imaging. You know, uh, TEE has made a huge difference of how we do procedures. People who did MitraClip with 2D TEE can tell you that it was the most painful thing in their existence. Um, I, I, was, I was too young for that, but uh, we always had 3D TEE for our procedures. But now, you know, there is more and more uh, tendency or a, a move to what can we do with minimally invasive technique? How can we avoid general anesthesia? So there are, you know, micro TEEs being invented. There are intracardic echoes that there are be, catheters that are being refined to produce these kind of images that you could see. So this is the first in human uh, LAO case that using the very site uh, from Philips that allows you to park the catheter. This was contrast free, put the catheter in, in one location here. We just placed it across the mitral valve, looked at the appendix from below. You get multiplanar reconstruction, you verify your size, you deploy, you get a 3D image that is pretty close to what you would get with TEE uh, under moderate sedation and send the patient home the same day. So this, this is the, with this catheter became available to us back in June and we've done about 50 cases, LAO cases with it. Uh, and it's allowed us to minimize our contrast use to 10, 15 cc's a case now. We've also explored how to uh, use that catheter for other applications. So there is a case series coming up in Jack Imaging talking about the use in mitra clip, the use in tricuspid clip, the use in a variety of different procedures. Uh, I don't think this technology is TEE quality yet. I think that would be a, an overestimation of its capability now. But remember that the way they constructed this catheter is they took a third of a TEE probe and they, uh, they, they constructed it in a way that can be inserted in the vascularity. So in the future, once those things evolve, I think we're gonna, we're gonna be able to um, do conscious sedation, wild procedure with a combination of intravascular and transthoracic imaging, TE imaging. It doesn't really matter which modality, it's just exciting to see that all of the different modalities are, are massively improving over time. 3D printing has been an area of hype as well because people will tell you, well, I'll just go for the procedure. Maybe if we print this, we could see it a little bit better, but it's not a huge deal. I think that is a little bit short-sighted. Uh, it can help your procedure substantially. Unfortunately, I had a procedure just a couple of days ago where without 3D printing, we could have not really uh, done the procedure that easily. It was an LVOT um, pseudoaneurysm after surgery. And with the use of 3D printing, it shortened the procedure substantially. I just don't have the images to show you here. But procedural planning is just one small aspect of 3D printing. I think custom-made procedure is going to be the future for this niche area in adult congenital, even in, in, in adult, uh, in general, um, structural heart problems. But that will become more and more available uh, and maybe 10, 20 years away, but that's what we're doing here. We're just doing prediction of the future. So, you know, TEE has, has been a major revolution in our field in the not last 20, 30 years. Uh, but I think ICE will become a mainstream in a lot of procedures. Um, and 3D printing will advance from being just a pure planning tool to be more of a, uh, to able to produce custom made devices. Uh, next prediction is about heart failure interventions, right? Um, I, 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 I intentionally omitted um, PE interventions, even though they're both coming about the same speed. But I think innovation, the, the size of the population at risk or who would benefit from the procedure dictates the speed of how things would evolve. And we have a huge population of heart failure, especially with HFPF that are undertreated. So I think that the innovation in this field and the interest in pioneering in this field are going to go wild in the next 10, 20 years, especially now that we're going to have 
way more advanced and more uh, miniaturized uh, ways of monitoring. We don't need to do that big procedure where you put you know, an octopus in, the, in a branch of uh, the PA to measure pressure. You're gonna have much more agility in using wearable devices and new things that can monitor the patient along the road. We're also going to see more and more really truly innovative things that can change heart failure. So we've seen you know, a lot of shunts. Um, one of the most innovative ones was the SVC to um, the SVC to the coronary sinus shunt that has been pioneered by Edwards and is undergoing an IDE study now because that kind of shunting would allow you to do the same as the intra-atrial shunting without leaving any procedure, any, any device in the atrium. So you have that access, access for your future, uh, given that these patients have a lot of uh, needs for transeptal procedures. Uh, you're gonna see procedures aiming to drain the lymphatic system and other procedures aiming to unload the heart in the least invasive way possible either during an acute heart failure exacerbation or in the setting of a STEMI. We already started seeing those coming up. So for heart failure intervention, I think heart failure is going to, to continue to rise for giving the aging of the population. We have limited effective interventions. We have good medications, but for patients who remain symptomatic on medications, we don't have good interventions. That will probably become a major player, and I, I could predict 30, 40% of cath lab volume in 2040 will become heart failure interventions. So if you wanna buy stocks, go ahead, just kidding. Um, the, the last one is, 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 is more softer, and it's related to how we educate and we share knowledge. This is the traditional way, right? You have to sit in the conference, Put some coffee so you don't dose off and then go to these big conferences and watch the five masters uh, of cardiology doing these cases that nobody else can do right that was five years ago nowadays tutorials took over uh, to the point that these conferences are embraced social media as their main way of disseminating knowledge how many of you would hear about a study now by actually reading the paper or logging into watching the presentation of the late breaking clinical trial versus looking at the tutorial or the summary slide on Twitter, right? So it's just the reality of how things are being done now. And even, you know, simulation is rising, but most importantly, the live cases are no longer the purview of those, you know, few selected gifted individual that nobody can mimic. But anybody at now can, in, can install these RCS systems, cameras in their cat labs that can be viewed by any phone in the world. And, you know, just say, I have a live case going on after five minutes, guys. Can you just jump in and you could allow them to point, put a pointer on your screen, allow them to share, talk, discuss as you are doing the case on the fly. Uh, that will be more uh, advanced also in the future when you impose virtual reality techniques on it, where, you know, people can actually take, you know, instead of just putting a simple marker, they could take their fingers and point at the watchman device. They point at, you know, the, if you're doing a dissection session, they will point at the structure that you're looking at and ask you intelligent questions. So that was the last prediction. Sorry, I didn't have a prediction statement for this, but I think uh, in the future, we're going to uh, see, we already see this, this, this was supposed to be the future, but the pandemic made it, made it now, uh, but this will continue to rise. And I, I do, you know, I, I made fun of my interventional friends where they were celebrating uh, holograms on Twitter a couple months ago saying, oh, we did the first conference on hologram. And I posted a video of Partha doing that, I don't know, eight years ago or seven years ago. So, you know, that that is coming and it's going to be very, very common and hopefully will democratize knowledge and would allow people who didn't have access or can't pay to travel for conferences to have knowledge uh, handy. I'll finish with this quote by Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln. So the, you know, we talked about the future, how we, how at least I predict it will be. You may have different predictions. But we, it's, it's upon us to select, to be bystander and go to conferences and say, yeah, doctor so-and-so this is, said, this is how we should do it. So we should do it that way. Or you could select to, you know, may, 
participate in that in the making of that future and uh, shape it the way you want. The only way to predict the best way to predict the future is to shape it and to create it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mahmoud, uh, for this excellent uh, talk. And uh, we will quickly bring our panelists uh, uh, discussions um, onto uh, the panel. So our panelist is uh, um, our Dr. Ashok Chaudhary. Dr. Chaudhary is an assistant professor uh, and interventional cardiologist. Uh, he's uh, also been in the structural heart uh, procedure. Uh, and also we have a second uh, uh, panelist uh, is uh, uh, Dr. Abdul Hakim. Um, uh, Dr. Hakim is a social professor of medicine and also interventional cardiologist. He's also um, the director of interventional cardiology research and also the program director for the interventional uh, program. Now, I thought, uh, 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 Mohammed, you uh, covered a very wide uh, variety of uh, amazing uh, things that have happened in interventional cardiology. But let's let's try to make it more practical for um, uh, for for our. Uh, group here, uh, especially, especially the fellows. So, um, and I'm going to go with the panelists also with their reaction. The typical um, attraction to interventional cardiology and structural uh, cardiology is uh, immense. But the 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 challenge is how do you become an academic cardiologist? Because the pressures of uh, trying to get through the day and the procedures and where do you get the time? And typically, how do you do uh, how did you do, uh, uh, Mohammed, when you were a fellow or a young faculty, to still maintain to publish and do any of the academic work? Because there is no no protected time or no time that exists. And then we'll we'll come down and see how um, uh, our panelists uh, react to that. Yeah, thank you, Parth. That's a great question. You know, I'll I use a quote from a Nobel Prize winner uh, who said that um, to be able to you know, to do research and create an academic career, you have to have a child mindset. You have to be inquisitive and curious. So curiosity is, it has nothing to do with medicine. It's, it's just the nature, but it could be acquired too. So having a, a curious nature that I really want to question how, why we do, why do we do it this way? You know, uh, the, 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 the most list disliked answer that I hear is because we, this is the way we've always done it. Uh, right, so so I think having a curious mind is 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 a prerequisite. That's number one. But you could you could acquire that. It's it's not like if you don't have it, you cannot get it. But you have to be aware and present, and just try to think, try to take a step back from your daily tunnel vision life and see if you can think differently. The second thing is, you know, you have to forget about time and all of those things. And I don't know if I have a good, if this is a good answer for your faculty, but uh, as you know, a lot of times, even when we're doing simple research, not practice changing anything, we were motivated and driven by, we really wanna be participating in advancing the knowledge. So I think most of our papers in West Virginia came out out of um, Panera after hours, between Panera and Starbucks, uh, we've had a lot of successful fruitful meetings but it, it came from the curiosity and you know to be able to get to the cutting edge things you have to start somewhere you're never going to start by well i invented something out of the blue these people that i mentioned to you the intern who invented taver you know even krunzig all of those people they just it's not like a something the light turned off and turned on and they found something they were always inquisitive they were always trying right and then you start something small and adapt. So, so if you say, I don't have the protected time, I don't have the infrastructure, start with something simple, start with case reports, start with review, start with something, master something, right? That's what actually, if you, uh, there was an interview with the Jack editor, Dr. Fuster, and he said, he gave the same advice. He said, I can't tell fellows who, who keep telling me, we don't have any resources, write a good review write a review that will be the most cited review on this topic or in this niche area. So I think starting some, having the curious mind, having the motivation and starting somewhere uh, is always key. And then you see it, it will upscale. There is no question. You'll get opportunities, get recognized and it will upscale, but you have to start somewhere and be persistent. 
Yeah, and um, I think um, I've seen you doing that uh, very, very um, uh, successfully with the fellows. So I think you were also able to motivate large teams and groups to get the work done. So having a plan in place to how to proceed through the um, through writing the papers, and I think was also equally. Uh, I saw that you did it very successfully. So uh, Ashok, I wanted to ask you, uh, what, what do you think uh, uh, needs to be done in terms of, um, I, I know that uh, you and Mohammed are speaking about uh, several projects. How do you, how, what, would, what would be the opportunity for creating collaboration for us in, in New Brunswick? What is the future of uh, structural and interventional uh, collaborative cardiology, if I might call, because ultimately, um, uh, be, if you are in the community or if you're from the academics, it doesn't matter. But we do need to have a, a way to move forward to this, uh, um, to create something new and innovative. Have, what, are, what are your thoughts about how we could achieve that? So, um, uh, Mama, that was an excellent presentation. I think we all learned a lot and then the future is exciting. So um, definitely, I think collaboration makes a lot of sense. Um, I think we, we did discuss a few times as well. Uh, some of the low hanging fruits would be like uh, coming up with some sort of unanswered questions and, and having some sort of uh, multi, uh, uh, some sort of registry where we uh, come up with some of our patients and then uh, contribute to the, uh, the bigger question uh, and, and, and be a part of a registry where you know, we are also giving some patients and we're also getting some patients from Mayo or some other hospital. Uh, as simple as like uh, some of the, so one of the things we we're discussing was, um, you know, uh, it could be in the appendix area, it could be in the matric clip area. So registry is one option. Second option is um, uh, a case series of some sort. Uh, again, you know, we are working with the fellows. Instead of just doing a, a, a unique case report that we have here, we could look for a case series and then, and then collaborate. And, and definitely that can slowly build up into a bigger collaboration, um, but I think um, uh, that will be a, a easy, uh, simple way of uh, building collaboration. Starting as a registry, I think would be would, would make sense. That's great, and you know, and um, uh, Abdul has been uh, uh, trying to uh, get the structure of the research. Obviously, there's a lot of work need, that needs to be done um, to have the framework for doing clinical trials, and um, I mean, we are part of several clinical trials in the structural uh, space. Um, what are your thoughts about how our interventional uh, fellowship program uh, could resonate with something that uh, Mohammed uh, uh, presented? And I just wanted your reflections on. You know, this is the time for us to reflect because we learn and we look into the future and we position ourselves. The whole idea of this future series is to motivate people to think differently, uh, along with uh, uh, leaders. Um, what are your thoughts? I think the sh short answer is uh, send him to Muhammad for, for a month and, you know, he'll come and he'll enlighten all of us. So, no, I think that was that was indeed um, a spectacular presentation, uh, especially things that you said that that I took uh, for my uh, maturity were, uh, you know, few few words that really resonated uh, with me were uh, the things about uh, having the liberty uh, to uh, try and do new things, uh, which uh, can be very challenging and problematic in, 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 in the environment that we're working. But I think uh, liberty, there is always some wiggle room. Um, obviously, I'm not suggesting uh, doing things that uh, are, are um, maybe considered disastrous, but um, uh, trying to uh, uh, trying to adopt new things, uh, uh, collaborate with uh, people uh, like Dr. Alcoli, uh, uh, who have mastered uh, and are on the path of innovation. Um, I think for interventional fellows, um, we we have one interventional fellow. We could expand the program uh, to 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 multiple. Uh, I think uh, the most important step really would be to to instill them in them the 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 idea the passion of of um, innovation. Uh, you know, if we look across the board, and I don't know, a couple of hundred, maybe four or five hundred interventional 
fellows uh, get trained every year and maybe a few hundred structural heart fellowships across the country. Um, I think this piece of innovation is, is really missing. Uh, like Dr. Alkoli said, um, each time there's a new device, we want to jump on it and try putting it in. And then, you know, you go through these exhaustive back and forths with the, with, with, with the trialists about uh, trying to get your um, uh, patient approved for a certain trial. Uh, recently, we've had quite a few rejections, especially patients who have MAC and they have MS and MR. Uh, I, 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 I think, uh, trying to bring innovative things like maybe 3D printing, uh, the other things that that Dr. Alkoli spoke about um, uh, is, is, is certainly that uh, something that 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 requires uh, a lot of um, uh, thought uh, and but instilling that that passion, that vigor, that vim, uh, in, in the trainee is something uh, that, um, you know, now most programs, a lot of programs, uh, uh, for instance, in Co Columbia and in Washington Hospital Center, I'm, I'm not sure at Mayo Clinic, they have a two-year uh, fellowship program where one year is, is, is really dedicated to research. Uh, you know, you go in and out of the cat lab, but, you know, you take on big projects, you do things that... Um, so, so perhaps uh, that's something to look into um, for ourselves locally here. Uh, get get a certain funding and and maybe uh, uh, identify people who really would be uh, uh, willing to to uh, perhaps be thought leaders in the field uh, and and get them grants. Um, uh, I think uh, that 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 needs to happen, but unfortunately, interventional cardiology and structural cardiology, it's more a technique based. Um, you know, people want to learn skill. They wanted to say, oh, I did a thousand PCIs, I did four hundred towers during my fellowship, and I did one hundred and fifty mitral clips. So I think coming out of that mindset and just trying to look into, okay, what have I contributed to the field? Um, I think that's that's where the the focus should be. Yeah, I was particularly uh, very in, uh, uh, very happy to see, Mama, that you are more and more embracing towards uh, looking at the more nuanced uh, understanding of cardiac pathophysiology, the flow. I've been always very uh, um, critical about just an approach based upon. Um, the pressure volume curves and and there there's a full theory of heart function that has evolved based upon those and how we practice currently even uh, even heart failure we put the schwann gans and we are uh, just looking at a few numbers and and we are deriving a lot of information but integrating the whole information with how actually the heart is working is somehow is missing and and many of these devices are evolving without even any considerations and, and that's actually, in my opinion, a very open opportunity. I have a tremendous interest and in, and we can put in a program, uh, maybe a Mayo Clinic, uh, and we can combine and create a program where to set up a flow function relationship with pressures, integrate, and AI could be the engine to integrate that whole um, uh, complexity of the information, because I think that's where uh, maybe some information will uh, emerge. I'm really worried that uh, it's okay for octogenarians to get a tavern and you know survive for a few more years, but when you're starting to do these clips and all these procedures to younger and younger uh, patients, not sure what we are trying to do to their systems and body. And and we already know that mitral valve repair is better. Um, this is known, but if there is a better way to position us on the valves and create a more physiology um, and harmony. Uh, I think there could be a great opportunity and this may be something we could create a registry and would be an interesting area to explore. And that's, that's, that's been my, you know, I, uh, one of the things that I have done, maybe successfully, maybe not, is I, I, do, I do move a little bit fast. So, okay, well, I, I, I did a lot in this field and I understand that I, I, I don't want to keep beating a, a dead horse. So, so I moved to something else and I moved to something else. So I, I'm really seeing this flow dynamic and hemodynamic as a, a hugely missed opportunity. Uh, maybe it's, it's a good thing because there is, there is room for people to do things in it. 
And it's not an area of interest for anybody with uh, uh, influence or weight in the field because most of those people have been so far along the road, right? With the current stuff, with the current devices, as you said, the tool that, you know, they were just waiting for the next valve or the next whatever. And they're all incremental stuff, but we're talking here about something that can be disruptive, can be, can, can change how we understand diseases. I mean, and again, always start with what you have. You know, Ashok, don't underestimate the value of a case report or case series. I mean, Partho and I, we had a few case reports in West Virginia. They were first human ways of doing things. Uh, so case reports are not, not I, I wouldn't underestimate them. If, if they serve only to keep you motivated and keep you engaged, that, that's enough. But you don't have to be at Columbia or Washington Hospital Center or Mayo to actually have an innovative program. Indeed, all what you need is somebody who can embrace that and a few people who are motivated to keep pushing that. So for example, that flow dynamic work that I just started doing here about a year and a half ago, uh, I don't have anybody around me here at my institution who is who has a program with that. So my collaboration has been mostly with other institutions, but we started and you know you learn and there is, a, as, as Partho said, there is a good opportunity. And these are things that you don't need a huge number of patients or a huge number of you know resources to a huge amount of resources to to achieve these are things that you need some resources but a lot of you know collaboration and smart planning yeah i mean that's great one of the other things i i thought was very interesting in your discussion was the multimodality imaging and and very impressed with the with the pictures of ice that you're so and so i mean we have a special interest in ice i know partho um, and I, we have discussed about this before. So that is one of the areas where we can collaborate about, um, you know, using ice imaging in different techniques, like the, uh, the you know, starting as simple as ASTP of a closer to something like mitral and tricuspid. So that's that's something else that we can collaborate on, definitely. So it's not very popularly known, but uh, Mahmoud then myself, we've started doing a lot of uh, conscious sedation, uh, pediatric teas and uh, cases. and. Um, and at the, I mean, they went, they went pretty easy. I mean, there was no problems uh, with them. And of course, ice is also an alternative, but I mean, you can get, if you don't have ice also, you can get a conscious sedation yeah, probe, yeah. you done very, very easily. And it's, it's the challenges with the, um, having our colleagues and everybody to understand what the protocol will be for the deep sedation to get through the, um, uh, but there are alternative methods to be able to do. Maybe IS is not always available everywhere, but there are other ways to get through a conscious sedation. You don't have to, but it's not very popular. Yeah, I, I think I think what we learned also is you have one of the main things that I would suggest you do, Ashok and Abdul, if you would like, um, is you know take a step back and think what are the resources that are available because you don't like if you are if I were in West Virginia and I wanted to do device innovation, like I cannot make a device in West Virginia. That was not an option. It, was, it would be too difficult to do, right? You go to uh, Stanford and you're next to the Silicon Valley and everybody is talking devices. It will be not very smart to ignore that opportunity, right? So take a step back and think about, okay, there are a hundred million pathways I could go, but what are things that are available to me now that my institution is good at or I could I could use the resources that I have right I mean currently you have parts you have AI you have flow dynamics you have these kind of things so uh, those are available you have a large volume of patients you could you could participate you know we wanted to we asked for funding to to do a multi-center registry for device related thrombus with watchmen we got denied so we did it without money we just did it with fellows and we got 700 cases. It was a Jack paper, and um, it gave us a DRT score. So those kind of things you could do. But I think part of the, to start just getting a little bit more oriented about where to invest time and money is, is just to select what do I have here, right? Uh, what should I not miss? And then build, you know, maybe select one or two or three venues and collaborate with young physicians or other senior physicians who are interested in the field and then and then just start small successes build up and i mean there is no no more pleasure than having you know small papers getting accepted and public that that just creates this you know cycle of interest and excitement that will keep you on yeah and we will try to create a, maybe a registry opportunity for um people from uh, here faculty from here to collaborate with perhaps 
Mohammed's group there uh, and be I mean I could give you a practical example now so we have after we built our 500 uh, microclip database we're now making that much more comprehensive much, much many more fields and we're building that in red cap the advantage of that is and we have an IRB to collaborate with other sites what we will do then once we finish that is we will call Ashok and you and say you know, we want to write a paper on single leaflet detachment, or we want to write a paper about atrial functional MR and mitroclip. Uh, we, you don't have to insert 700 variables for each patient, but we've decided that these 50 variables are the most relevant for this project. We will send you a link to the external red cap, and you just insert that, and that will be a rather fast way of building databases. The days of you know TVT registry and CDR and all of that, it's it's not gonna last very long because those databases have been used a lot and they're not really accessible to the majority of interventionists who wanna do research. Very good. So with those uh, words, and I think this was a great um, presentation. I think lots of people waited till um, for almost 20 minutes above the hour. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mohammed, for joining. Thank you, Ashok and Abdul, for joining as well. And I think we will leave a lot of people motivated. And this video is going to be available on YouTube to share. And please go ahead uh, and claim your CME and MOC and um, uh, popularize this uh, on the website also. Thank you very much. And good evening and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay.